pleasure to introduce our keynote speaker, Dr. Jeff Borden. He is the Vice President for Instruction and Academic Strategy at Pearson. He's also a dynamic speaker, professor, researcher, comedian, trainer, and dad. Jeff recently spoke at the Northeast Regional Computing Program Annual Conference, testified before the U.S. Congress's Education Committee, he noted a 6,000 audience member conference in Asia and presented in a new medium consortium virtual symposium for the future. With a diverse and rich background, Jeff comes to us knowing that very few people will spend their time, energy, or money on a technology asset or application that doesn't get them something in the end. For Jeff, technology should excite, save time, and provide meaningful assistance and experiences. He will talk to us about how to make technology more effective for you and your students. Please help me welcome Dr. Jeff Ford. I forgot to mention I was my sixth grade president twice. <laughs> so uh, I want to talk to you today about technology as it does apply to humanity, how we can use it meaningfully, hopefully, uh, in an educational context. I go around the world <clears throat> talking to educators who tell me there's all kinds of things that you cannot teach uh, using technology. I talk to medical professionals who say you can't teach medicine online, you can't use technology to do that, even though we have these really tremendous simulators and, and different things that we can do in and around the patient. I talk to uh, art teachers who say you can't teach art online, and uh, I'll, I'll ask them, I'll say, wait, wait, why can't you teach these things online? Why, why can't you use technology for these things? And an art teacher said to me, uh, it's because you can't teach perspective. You cannot begin to teach how things appear, apply, look in, uh, in any form or another. This is called Sketch of a Woman from the Inside Out. This was developed by a Brazilian artist who wanted to begin teaching perspective at a distance. So using flash technology, which is ubiquitous today, it was not necessarily 10 years ago, but it is today, he started to put down on paper what it looks like to build a human being. And then he put it into a technology. So he is building a skeleton that he's gonna put on skin, that he'll put on hair, that he'll put on clothes. It, it's really quite remarkable when you start to see what we can do at scale, at a distance today. That's what I wanna to talk to you about. Now, first of all, I'm gonna apologize. I know you probably wanna see this end. I'm, I'm going to, uh, you'll get the PowerPoint, okay? You'll, you'll get to see it. Um, but I wanna to try to illustrate this by showing you something that is sort of old school versus new school. See, we know more about the brain we know more about learning, we know more about how we function than we've ever known before. And yet it often does not make it into what we do on a regular basis. So I'm going to have you all, just in just one moment, take a sobriety test for me, okay? If you've never done that, have you done that? If you've never done that, here's how we're gonna do it. In just a moment, I'm going to have you stand up. I'm going to have you point at the walls, all right? I'm gonna have you look up at the sky and then close your eyes. I'm going to have you lift one of your legs off the ground and then I'm gonna start counting to 10. While I count to 10, I would like you to one at a time just take your finger and take it, push it to your nose over here and remember you're looking like this. If at any point your leg goes back down to the ground, I would like you to please sit down, okay? Only those who are able to keep one leg off the ground the entire time should be standing at the end. Everybody with me? All right. Please stand up. Please point your arms at the walls. Please put your face facing the ceiling. Close your eyes. And one. Good. Lift your leg up. Lift your leg up. One. Two. Three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. All right, now wait a minute. The four of you remaining, please give them a round of applause. You've done this before, Candy. Yep. <laughs> The question I have, how much have the rest of you had to drink? <laughs> this test works 93% of the time with accuracy. 
when you compare it with those who have actually gone through a breathalyzer, which is 100% accurate, then you can actually see that this works almost every time with a, a person who is inebriated. However, there is something else that we know about the human brain, that we know about anatomy and physiology, that applies here. Did you know that if you wake yourself up early, meaning you wake yourself up with an alarm, you don't wake up naturally, you just ask an alarm to wake you up, and it does so in the midst of a REM cycle, which in the morning you're having more REM cycles than you're having at any other time during the, during the night. If it wakes you up during a REM cycle, you will be cognitively impaired for four to eight hours after that experience to the point of having a blood alcohol level of 0.10. Cognitively speaking, you are inebriated, you are drunk for four to eight hours. Some people, it actually lasts the entire day because you forced yourself to wake up when you shouldn't have. We know from research, we know from what, what we have studied about the brain, there are essentially three kinds of people under the age of 25. There are those who should have all of their learning completed before noon. There are those who should not begin to try to learn until 10 a.m. And then there are those who fall somewhere in the middle. Now, over time, that changes. We know that as you get older, you need less sleep. You can wake up earlier, things like that. But it really does break down into almost perfect thirds for those under the age of 25. And yet, we still have classrooms that are only available at 8 a.m at 9 a.m. for all students. That's the one shot that they have to take that class. And there's a whole group of students who are going to struggle in that environment. At the same time, there are students who are taking classes at 3, 4, 5 p.m. not because it's best for them, because it's what's best for the school or it's what's best for the teacher. We know more about the brain than we have ever known before, and it's time to start employing some of that inside of our classrooms. When I go around the world talking to educators, I talk to them about things like boredom. And I love this definition of boredom. Boredom is about wanting to engage in some sort of satisfying activity, but being unable to. And when I ask people about boredom in school, the reaction I get is, is strange to me. Most people, when I say, do you have kids? Yeah, I have kids. Are they in school? Yeah, they're in school. Do they like it? Oh, no. Yeah. Are they bored? Oh, all the time. Is that OK with you? Well, sure, school. <laughs> it's an interesting thing, isn't it? That we're just okay with that being the norm for education, that it's, it's, it's boring. But there's some problems that are starting to come out of that. If you look at uh, this, some of the research that's being done about student satisfaction, boredom is being seen by students as not something that's just bad, it's something that they are saying it's unacceptable. We're going to stop being bored. We're going to find other ways to do it is what some students are starting to say. They're having sit-ins, they're having strikes. They're starting to do some interesting things. It reminds me of the, the 60s in terms of what, what they're saying about this. At the same time, while students may say they're bored, when you look at what boredom does, there's some interesting research coming out of Canada and the UK right now that talks about the, the uh, hormone cortisol. Cortisol is actually infused into your bloodstream when you have been bored for a very short period of time. In fact, if you've bored for seven minutes straight, your blood is saturated with cortisol. Now, cortisol, if you don't remember, is the, called the stress hormone. Cortisol leads to all of this stuff, fatigue. It uh, leads to depression. It leads to the inability to sleep. It leads to problems with weight. It leads to suicidal thoughts. We are literally killing our students with boredom. And for some, some educators say, well, it's the way it's got to be. My uh, discipline isn't always that exciting. My subject matter isn't always that intriguing. And for those people, I'm going to try to argue today that we need to take on a different perspective in terms of master teaching. We need to look at what it is to be a master teacher so that this can be replaced with things that are engaging. And we have seen over time that technology can be that thing. It doesn't have to be. I completely agree with the premise of the entire conference. There are times that technology does not make the most sense. However, there are just as many times that it does. And we ignore it because we don't understand it. We don't want to use it. We don't want to take the time to explore it. And I want to see if I can't talk about that this morning. Now, hopefully, I'm talking to what I call the middle, the middle people, the middle ground. 
I don't know if you know if you know these people. I, I've come to the conclusion that across college campuses around the globe, everywhere, there are really three kinds of people. On one end, you've got the evangelists. The, e the evangelists are those that say technology fixes everything. It is going to take care of every problem that we have. They often overpromise and underdeliver, right? These are the people who are saying you should be teaching on Facebook because Facebook exists. That's a horrible description, but they're, they're the ones who are often beating that drum very loudly, right? Saying technology, technology, technology. On the other hand, the other end of the spectrum, you see what I call the cave people, colleagues against virtually everything. <laughs> Do you know these people? Think about a cave person. Yeah, they're not here today. Think about a cave person in your life, all right? By the way, if you can't think of one, you might be, no. <laughs> they are often on the other side of the equation, and they are also screaming loudly. And so you've got these two very loud people on either end of the spectrum. But I really think that in the middle is, is where most of us will reside. Be reasonable people. And that is who I am hoping that I'm speaking to today. Because when you're reasonable, you can look at a solution and say, does it help me? Does it provide value? Does it bring me satisfaction? Does it help me do something I couldn't do otherwise? Does it save me time? Does it, does it help my life? Does it help my student's life? We can look at solutions like that, and we can say, that's reasonable. I'll try it. And that's what we're after, right? <laughs> Talking about how we can take technology and infuse it in the right context, in the right situation, at the right time. And so as you look at my life, you can actually review it in terms of a, uh, a technological resume. This would be my Wordle. Uh, my, if you're not familiar with Wordle, I hope you all are, it's a, it's a nice word cloud generator that you take a body of text and the words you use the most are the biggest, the words you use the least are the smallest. And so my Wordle would look something like this. You would see up here that I am a professor of communication and rhetoric, uh, that I also have my doctorate in education, I am a vice president at Pearson. I, I run an academic research center. We, it's basically a think tank where all we do is look for academic problems and academic solutions. But at the same time, you might notice up there that I am a husband and I'm a dad. I've got a little girl named Addie and uh, we've got a dog named Doug. And it's not until you put this stuff into a meaningful pattern that you get a decent sense of this guy who's standing before you today. What I want to try to do is talk about these things and put them into a little bit more reasonable pattern for you today. What I call the C's of education, and there are a lot of them. Creativity, critical thinking, curriculum integration, content. As we start thinking about computer literacy and all these different C's of education, I wanna see if I can't help put them into a form that looks uh, a little bit more navigable for us so that we can navigate those C's of education together. And so to do that, I'm going to talk through a lens of something I call Education 3.0. It is a filter of neuroscience, learning research, and education technology. If we want to deliver, at scale, meaningful education for the future, I believe that we need to employ these three things on a regular basis. Now that said, I'm going to talk today about things like choice. I want to talk a little bit about social learning and what that looks like. I want to talk a little bit about something that you may have heard before, the do, tell, show, review, ask mantra. Uh, I want to talk about how to fish for some of these assets. And then finally, create, consume, remix, and share the old Web 2.0 mantra. I want to see if I can regenerate that a little bit today. So as we talk about what it is we're going to do, let's start at Harvard. Since I'm in New England, I think it's appropriate. Some of you may know Richard Light. Maybe you may know Richard Light's study that he uh, put, put on back in the 90s. From 1990 to 2000, Richard Light interviewed uh, 16, try that again, 1,600 students. He uh, had a 24-page interview guide. It was a two to three hour interview process. It was a massive undertaking. He interviewed students at community colleges, at technical colleges, at R1s, at Ivy League schools. He basically wanted to know from students, how was your experience? How did you do? What did you think? What was good? What was bad? What was the best? And so as he interviewed these students, some very interesting findings came out of the meta-analysis of the study. I want to share just a few of them with you today and talk about how they actually apply to neuroscience, to learning research, and to education technology. The first thing that Richard Light discovered was that choice matters. In fact, choice matters a great deal, especially as it relates to motivation and satisfaction. He asked students, uh, it, turned, it turned into an interesting uh, correlation. The very first question on the entire 
uh, interview guide was, what would you rate or rank your experience? If 10 is the best and one is the worst, what would you give your college experience? Now, there were two, essentially only two standard deviations here. We had, a, we had eights and nines, and we had sixes and sevens. Those were the two primary answers. Nobody gave a 10, not a single, not a single student gave a 10, but very, very few gave a five or below. So there were two large groups, sixes and sevens and eights and nines. And something interesting happened then when he asked a second question that turned out to be a follow-up, although they didn't know it was going to be a follow-up until they, they really got into it. They started asking students then, how did you first pick your classes when you came to your school? And the students that gave the sixes and sevens gave a very different answer than the students who said an eight or a nine. Those students who were less satisfied with the experience said, when I got to campus, I took the classes that I had to take. I took the classes I didn't want to take. I took the classes that I didn't enjoy taking so that I could save the good stuff for later. I wanted to do the good stuff at the end. So I did the junks, junk up first, the bad stuff at the end. Now, Richard Light asked, why did you do that? And they said, I got that advice from an advisor, from a college professor, from a brother or a sister, from a parent, they got this advice from someone else who said, just get the bad stuff over with and do the, the fun stuff at the end. Interestingly, by the way, when Richard Light started interviewing students who had dropped out, they took this same tack. The eights and nines, however, gave a very different answer. When the eights and nines were asked that question, how did you first pick your courses when you got to school? They said, I took a class every semester that interested me. Every single term, I took a class of something that I thought was fun, something that was engaging, something that was new or unique. I got to do something that I had never done before, see something I'd never seen before, it was, it was interesting. You know, there are college programs today around the country where they are requiring students to take a very specific track and path, and they don't even allow them that kind of choice. It's not even an option, it's not even on the table. So as we start to think about the power of choice, these students, when they employ choice in their programs, sometimes taking courses, by the way, that weren't even in their program, they had a much more meaningful experience with college. Now, we can do this today. I would like you to please get out your uh, device, get out your cell phone, get out your laptop, your iPad, whatever it is that you use. I'm hoping you have hooked up to the Wi-Fi here because I want to give you a choice. I want to talk for a moment about the power of games and how games can be employed in choosing. And so to ask you which of the two routes you want to go, I'm going to basically just going to ask you this. If you want to play a game in just a moment, I would like you to go to, send you, the easiest way to do is send me a text. So go to 22333 and send me the message 718993. All right, so the number you're going to send it to is 22333. You're going to send me the message if you want to play 718993. If instead you would like to see some examples of games, then I would like you to choose the other number, 718-994. Send that to the number 22333. Uh, there we go. Looks like we've got some people voting. So I'm interested to see what you might choose as we go through this. Essentially, all that I'm doing here is employing, this by the way is a tool called Poll Everywhere, polleverywhere.com. You can do uh, 25 users for free. You don't even have to, have to pay for this. Uh, but I'm allowing you some choice over where we engage this morning, all right? I use this in my classes, by the way. When I say to my students, we've got five things we need to cover this week, where do you want to begin? Now, I know the five things. I've taught them many, many, many times. I can teach them in order, out of order, however you want. And so I will give my students that feeling of choice, that empowerment that comes with choice, and allow them to just say, let's go here today. All right, let's see. Wow, 10 to 13. I've got a, a few, there's a few. I'll wait for just a couple more results, and then we'll make the decision. It's going to be close. This is like a horse race, <laughs> neck and neck. Some of you want to play, and some of you want to see. Interesting, interesting. Let's see, how about 30 more seconds? See if anybody else votes. By the way, you can vote more than once if you want to. <laughs> I think uh, up to 50 of you, I think I capped this particular poll at 50. Um, all right, see it is, all right. By the way, I'm gonna, I'm gonna leave the game in here that I was gonna play with you. We won't play it, but it is here, you can see it, and the game actually looks 
like this, okay? But when we talk about games, games absolutely equal choice. When you start to look at how games and serious games and gamification works in education, we basically take an outcomes back approach, which is how most people design their courses, all right? You, uh, you start at the outcome and you work your way back saying, here are some of the things that I would expect you to do. Now, please hear me. I know when I talk about gaming that some of you immediately shut off. I know that. But if, if the research is right, about half of you say, ah, uh, no, no, no. Not in my class. We're not playing Monopoly in my class. I'm not going to break out the clue game. That's just not going to happen. I get it. I get it. And I understand why. In fact, I can show you that. Here's what I'd like you to do. At your tables, you, I, I want you to play a game with me it, it, just real quickly, OK? You are on a boat. Your boat is sinking, all right? You have to get everyone from your table, this, this is a boat, into a life raft. The problem, it will hold all of you except one. One of you is not going to make it, OK? The person who gets in the water, by the way, is going to die, OK? You are not going to make it. You have 30 seconds to figure out who's getting in the life raft and who's getting in the water. Go. All right, time. Here's what I'd like. Every person who's getting in the water, please stand up. Okay. A round of applause for these people. They're going to take one to the team. Right, your whole group. Your whole group. They're all going to stand up. All right, have a seat. That's good. Now, that experience, that game, I know. That game that we just played has an inherent problem, and I'm going to tell you what it is. I won't even ask you. I'm just going to tell you. It's stupid. <laughs> right? That is a dumb experience because you all know you're not in a boat. I guarantee, and I'm, I promise that's what happened up here with these guys. As soon as I said, you're in a boat, so you all went, oh, all right. And then, and then when I said, somebody's got to get in the water, I know there's a group of you who went, whatever, I'll do it. <laughs> right? Because you're not, in a, you're not in a boat. You have no stake in this game whatsoever. Unfortunately, those are the games that we have been playing since the 60s and 70s that some people associate with educational gaming. That is not at all what I'm talking about. What I'm talking about are games with meaningful outcomes, like Folded. Folded was developed by AIDS researchers who for 15 years could not identify a retro protein. They couldn't figure out how it replicated itself or why it replicated in the fashion that it replicated. And so finally, after 15 years of not being able to figure this out, one of the scientists said, what if we make this a game and put it out on the net and let's see what happens if other people play it. Gamers figured out how it replicates in three weeks. Oh, wow. They believe this is going to be what helped them solve the AIDS puzzle. That's the kind of outcome that I'm talking about with a game. I'm talking about EnterZon. EnterZon is a game that's, that helps you learn edu uh, conversational Chinese. It was developed by a man named Dr. Zhao, who's at Michigan State. Uh, sorry, he's at Oregon State now, but he, he built this when he was at Michigan State. And he is, basically his whole goal is just to teach people how to talk in, in Chinese. That's what he wants to do. So he built a massive online role-playing game. He drops you in the middle of virtual China wearing nothing but a t-shirt and shorts. You have to feed yourself, you have to clothe yourself, you have to find shelter, you have to get a job, you have to earn money. The only way you're going to do that is by speaking Chinese over Skype with the other players. People are learning Chinese for free in this environment three, four, and five times faster than students sitting in a traditional lecture and then going back with, to a lab and conjugating verbs. All right, it's just not the same experience. Games work. When you look at gamification, and if you've never done it before, just go to your favorite search engine and put in serious games or gamification for learning. You will get some fantastic resources. You'll probably come across Jane McGonigal and some of her work. She's done some outstanding work with, with uh, alternate reality gaming. You'll come across probably Carl Kapp and hear about how he defines gamification. But again, gamification for learning or serious games will start to show you ways that you can employ tiny little elements of game in your courses that are both intrinsically and extrinsically motivating for your students to help with that motivation equation. Choice matters. Games can help us get there. 
John Seeley Brown said this best. I'll, I'll close up the game section on this. If you don't know John Seeley Brown, John Seeley Brown uh, works with NASA. He uh, went to Harvard. He is a physicist. He is a technologist, a futurist. Goes around the world talking to people about how to make things happen. And he has employed some of the smartest people on the planet as engineers. He said last year in a Wall Street Journal article, he said, if I had to hire someone today, I would rather hire a, a level 70 guild master from, from World of Warcraft than a Harvard MBA. Harvard called <laughs> and said, whoa, 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 John, John, come on. You went to Harvard. Why would you say that? He said, because the level 70 guild master hires, fires, they create strategies for professional development. They help people figure out how to do the things that the theoretical models at Harvard are teaching. But they're not doing it. They're just learning about it. I want the person who's done it. Harvard said that's ridiculous. Nobody would ever hire somebody who's a World of Warcraft level given these level 70 guild master. To which John replied, what about the president of Yahoo? And then Harvard hung up. <laughs> <laughs> Games work. We've got to start not, we got to start thinking about them differently, not the stereotype of breaking out the parcheesi and trying to find a way to tie that to what we're talking about. No, no, no. There are so many better ways that we can take educational gaming, serious gaming, gamification, and apply it to what we do in our classes. The second thing that Richard Light figured out that is uh, something we've been theorizing for years is that social learning really does make a difference. Now, he found this out in an interesting way. Science courses at the time, in 1990, were only experiencing about a 55% retention rate. That's not a good program number. All right, so 55% of the time, a person would start as a science major, they would then end as a science major. 45% of the time, they left. They either dropped out of school, or they went to another major, or whatever, they just, they just were gone. And so the science departments at these schools that were involved in the study said, can you ask why students are staying science majors? He said, sure, I'll put that in. So just uh, uh, on page three or four, he, he added in this question, if you happen to be a science major, why did you stay a science major? The answer was so profound that within two years, it changed this number from 55% up to 63%, and they have ridden that ever since. By the time the study was done, they had an 8% jump in retention just because of the answer to this one question. When students were asked, why did you stay a science major? Students said, because I joined a study group. That was it. That was the big aha. Now, here's the really interesting part. In 1990, at Harvard, at Boston College, at UMass, at a couple of the other schools that are on that list, this was cheating. Joining a study group was illegal. You weren't allowed to do it. The professors told you not to do it. By 1993, it was a requirement. <laughs> you had to do it. And still to this day, it's a requirement. When you get the opportunity to teach others, when you get the opportunity to learn from others in a different way, from your peers who are filtering language differently, who are using different metaphors and using different analogies, when you get that opportunity, things suddenly change very much. And so as I think about social learning, I then go to some of the work of Matthew Lieberman at UCLA. Matthew Lieberman has done some very interesting studies on the brain and what happens with socialness. In fact, did you know that your brain connects through one system, through one part of the brain when you're being social. And even if you're in a situation where you are doing five seconds of task, five seconds of social, five seconds of task, five seconds of social, the social part kicks on when you go to socialness, and then the task part kicks on when you go to task relatedness. And you literally disconnect from the social part. Your brain is wired to try to figure out how to be social when it needs to be social and not when it's not. Socialness is that important to us and to our brains. He then went on to find out that socialness actually has an impact on things like pain. I want to see if I can show you this as an example. Everybody with someone at your table, real quick, just give a quick little fist bump. All right. Now, you've just seen how to do it. For those of you who didn't know how to do it, that's called a fist bump, OK? All right. Here is what I would like you to do, please. I would like you to. Stand up and get into groups of threes, standing just a couple of feet apart from each other in a triangle. Okay? All right. Now, in your group 
group of three, please self-select. One of you needs to be an A, one of you needs to be a B, and one of you needs to be a C. All right, now everyone look up here. Here's what you're going to do in a moment. In just a moment, when I ask you to start, you are going to step forward. The A person is going to start. You're going to fist bump one of the other two people, and you're going to step back. The person who you gave the fist bump to, it is now on them to choose who to fist bump next. So then they will step forward to one of you, give you a fist bump, they'll step back. Now it's on the next person. All right, and so you're going to take turns basically handing off the fist bump. Okay? However, just for a moment, just bear with me, I'd like everyone to turn and face the glass back that face the doors. Only my A people, I want you to turn around and read what I have on the screen. Only the A's. Don't read it out loud, just read it to yourself. Okay, turn, turn back around, please. My people who are a B now face the screen. Please read what it says on there. Keep it to yourself. Okay, my people, go ahead and turn back around. My people who are a C, please read the screen. Okay, everybody start. I forfeit. Go ahead and start. Again, A is our first person to go. Go ahead. Keep going. Keep going, keep going. I didn't get the syllabus. I didn't get the syllabus. All right, have a seat. All right, everyone who was an A, raise your hand. How'd you feel? Yeah? Good? Now, for those of you that don't know what just happened, we replicated the experiment that Matthew Lieberman did. I asked some of you to stop, start ignoring others of you. It's not very nice. I asked you to start giving a fist bump only to one person when I said the phrase, keep going. And so one of you got left out. I'm sorry. But let me tell you why that's important. Matthew Lieberman did the same thing. He did it online. He created this thing called e-ball, and he gave you a little controllable hand. You had a joystick, and you got to choose who you threw a ball back and forth to, and you were told that there were other people in other rooms that were controlling the other players. After three minutes, though, of you throwing back the ball randomly to whoever you wanted, they stopped throwing the ball to you. In fact, they never threw the ball to you again, ever. You got to sit there and watch that ball go back and forth between two players who you thought were real for 15 minutes sitting in an fMRI machine. What Matthew Lieberman then found was something quite remarkable. The centers of the brain that lit up, lit up in the fMRI machine were identical to the centers of the brain that light up if you have just been kicked in the shin. If you just got a nail through your hand, the parts of your brain that light up are the same parts of your brain that light up when you're experiencing social pain. In fact, he wanted to make sure that this was something that was valid and reliable, and so he found out that there's something that can actually help with social pain. There's something that can help you numb or dull social pain, and that thing is Tylenol. <laughs> we need socialness. We are wired to be social. We want to be social. And yet, in many educational contexts, we are not allowed to be social. We are told to sit in a classroom, face forward, do our own work, mind our own business, much of the time. We are lectured at or lectured to much of the time. Socialness matters. If you want to see this at work in the uh, educational system, 
You can look at the Babson survey research results that just came out recently. Now, for the first time ever, this is, this is exciting, for the first time this year, educators have reached the norm of the population in terms of use of social media. All right, for the first time ever that's happened. So educators are now using social media, whether it's Twitter or Facebook or LinkedIn or whatever it might be, they're finally using it at the same pace as the rest of the world, okay? That's good. If you start to ask them, however, how they're using it professionally, not in the classroom yet, we'll get there in a sec, but if they're using it professionally, the number goes from 70% down to about 55%. About 55% of educators are using it for professional connections, typically LinkedIn. LinkedIn is the biggest use in this space. Uh, but they're, they're using it professionally about 55% of the time. However, when you ask them if they're using it in the classroom, the number jumps down to 40. About 40% 40 of teachers use social media in classrooms to connect students to other people, to other experts, to other students, to other environments that they simply could not have access to sitting in one classroom at one time. When you look at the tools, by the way, that are being used, I think it starts to suggest that social media might not be the best term for some of it. Because as you look at the tools that are being used, blogs and wikis are number one by far. And so that essentially suggests they're using it for students to collaborate in wiki form, but they're also using it for people to give one directional messages, themselves included. And after that, the second biggest use is podcasting. And they're using podcasts again because they want to push out information. So I don't know if I would call that social media as much as I would say another way to lecture. So when you look at socialness in the context of the classroom, we're not extending our walls, although we could be. What, uh, as you start to think about what this looks like, I think about Twitter. I was in Australia and an Australian professor said to me, I've got to tell you the story about Twitter. We were going uh, to, to build, in my, my engineering class, we were going to build a water purification system for the school. It's at the University of New England. They have, they're out in the middle of Australia. They've got horrible water. They're trying to figure out how to do this. So they, he was lecturing about it in his classroom. And all of a sudden, he uh, had a hand go up in the back of the room. And a student said, Professor, why don't we tweet this out and see if anybody can help us? And he said, he said to me, he said, Jeff, I got to tell you, I'm embarrassed to say this. I didn't know what that meant. <laughs> so I said, yeah, we should do that. <laughs> the student did. The student put out a message on Twitter, found some hashtags, tried to go out there and try to find. Within 45 minutes, they had gotten three responses from people who had actually built systems like that, one in South Africa, one in Australia, and one in the US. The professor connected with those three experts, and by the time a week had gone by, they had turned it into an event. They broke the class into thirds, and each one of those groups uh, of students consulted with one of those experts to try to come up with the best possible solution for a water filtration system for the campus. By the time the classroom was done, the last week of the class, they actually held this event where they pitched their idea to the school, to the community, to the, the rest of the university, and they picked one. They picked one of those systems that is now being built to filter water in Australia because of Twitter. We can use these tools in amazing ways to connect our students to other parts of the world. We can also use them internally. I like Twijector. Twijector allows me to just see what hashtags are rolling up at any given time. When I am lecturing to my students, which I don't do very often, believe it or not, but when I am, I like to give them a back channel to have conversations with me. So I will pause about once every 15 or 20 minutes, and I will go to the Twi Twijector channel, and I'll see what questions have been asked. And then we can have conversations about those things, and we can move on. I'll do this, by the way, sometimes at conferences as well, if I'm in a workshop and things like that. It's a really nice thing for some back channel and some feedback that can come back later. I like to uh, also use sites like this that are free. Now, this one I don't necessarily use because it's not in my discipline. This is the Mixer. The Mixer is a way for social learning to take place to teach another language. The Mixer says, why do we spend two years conjugating verbs in a classroom? instead of connecting students with people who speak that language naturally. That's what the mixer does. It puts you in contact with a person in the country that speaks that language. You teach them your language, and they teach you theirs. Now, teachers can interject as much as they want. You can say, please go through these sorts of sentences or these sorts of exercises. But think about what that means. That person who is used to hearing the language can correct your pronunciation, can tell you this is the best way to do that. You can have social experiences with them. We know from research, uh, this came out in a Spanish uh, journal about two years ago. Students were asked, why did you start taking a foreign language? There were two primary answers, two. Number one, they wanted to travel. 
And number two, they wanted to meet someone of the opposite sex. Those were the two reasons the students began taking foreign languages. We don't give them either of those opportunities in our classrooms. This does. So now we can employ social learning at scale around the globe when we start to infuse technology into what we're already doing in the classroom. Think about all the different ways we can connect socially today. From WebEx to Adobe Connect to Google Hangouts that are free. Whatever you, whatever you like to, to do, you can bring subject matter experts into your classroom. You can connect them with other students in other parts of the world that are doing similar things. We can make socialness a major component of our learning because we know how important it is to our brains. We can begin doing that at scale if we want to. The third thing that Richard Light found as he did these interviews, and this is my favorite finding of all, he found that something he called structured disagreement, what I, what I would think of as tension or conflict, really led to better learning. The students were asked a simple question. They were asked, how, uh, what, what was your favorite class? How, how would you describe the best class that you ever had? Now, interestingly, not a single student said a lecture, not one. But when they were asked what, your favorite what their favorite course was, the students answered with stuff like this. It was the class where we had a mock trial. It was the class where we fed the homeless. It was the class where we presented to the board of a, a local store about a new marketing advertising campaign that we, had to, we want to suggest to them. It was the class where we did something unusual, problem-based, difficult, challenging. There were no set problems and there were no set answers. We had to figure out what the problems were in order to come up with the solutions. Those were their favorite classes. Every time. <laughs> Which led Richard Light to ask a very important question. Why aren't all classes like that? Why do we still have classes that aren't exactly like this? Because this is what students remember. This is the information they retain. This is what they take with them from course to course to course. This is the best way for students to learn. Structured disagreement matters. This is basically a, an aspect of constructivism. Constructivism is, it, it has been difficult for educators to wrap their brains around because it is hard to measure. Because constructivism is so individualized. It is the personalized experience. And yet we know it to be more powerful. We know that it's better for memory. We know it's better for retention. We know that it's better for quick learning. We know it's better for all of these things. And yet it's difficult because it is so contextual in the person. But when you talk about flipped learning, you talk about problem-based learning, you talk about challenge-based learning, or service-based learning, whatever it might be, constructivism is really what we're starting to get at. Let me see if I can't show you an example of this. I would like you right now Pretend that you have just been given a million dollars to build a brand new learning space, okay? Now that's not unheard of. Uh, I have a, a friend of mine at, at Cal who said, I, he, he believes in the research he's done that about $40 million this year is being spent from grant money alone on re-engineering learning spaces. All right, in 2014 in the United States, we're gonna be spending from, from grants about 40 million just re-engineering learning spaces. I would like you to say you've just been given a million bucks. How would you, as professional educators, Set up a learning space. Pick any place on campus you want it to be, or it can be out, wherever you want it to be. I want you to think about how you would build a learning space to make use of all the things you know about teaching and, and put them into, a, into one single learning space. I can't give you a ton of time for this, but just start brainstorming what you might do in that environment. Go ahead. Okay, I am going to assume that you came up with some good ideas with the not a lot of hand gestures. I saw, a lot of, I saw a lot of this and a lot of that. And all this. Um, I just would like to hear really quickly just a couple of answers. I got, I'm going to play Phil Donahue here. Um, somebody give me one of your ideas. I think it's particularly clever. You're being pointed at. Couches and walls of glass. All right, so open, an open feel. Yeah? Somebody else? Yeah. Some area was set up like a typical classroom with a projector and so forth. Others would be comfy chairs. Maybe another area would be quiet learning where people could get off by themselves in different zones in the building. Good. Zoned learning. So putting people in the, the space that is based on what they're trying to accomplish. I'm going to guess that you all came up with some fairly consistent ideas, but here's the point. You can do that because you're teachers. This is important to you. You're passionate about education. You're, you're here for a reason. Right, this is what you do. If nothing else, you may have thought to yourself, how can I make a space more efficient so that I can do what I have to do better? Right? If nothing else, you know this. And so me asking you to do this was easy. 
Now, if I were using it as a teaching experience, if I was including this in a classroom, I would want to put in your way some assets. I might want to give you some research. I might want to point you in the direction of some experts. I might want to show you some YouTube videos of places where they've done some of these things. I might start to show you Monash University in Australia. I currently work with a man named Gordon Sanson. He's there on the right. And Gordon, uh, over the last several years of his tenure, he has, he has left, he has retired from Monash and, and is now consulting with me uh, just part time. But he spent about $5 million American to build some learning spaces, and they were remarkable. They were beautiful. He built these learning spaces that had projection on every screen so that students could take their laptops and devices and literally project whatever it is that they're working on on various parts of the walls. He created this room where uh, students can actually be elevated up through the room or the floor will collapse down and you can create pods for groups and then you can put up these little <laughs> walls so that people are in group spaces all around. It was remarkable, it was amazing. He had sound engineers come in, lighting engineers come in, and when it was all said and done, he said to me, Jeff, we just wasted $5 million. <laughs> I said, why, Gordon? These places are, I've seen them. I've been there. They're amazing. They're beautiful. How can you possibly say that? He said, if you would have simply given me a decibel reader, some colored light bulbs, and a scented candle, I could have accomplished in that room exactly what I accomplished as long as every student had a tablet. Now, uh, I'm going to share one of those with you so you know what I'm talking about. But that's the kind of thing I might put in your way if I had given you this as an assignment. Because in an assignment, you're not just going to sit around a table and brainstorm ideas. You need to go out and research, right? You need to do a little bit of the work and see what other people have done, see if it's been effective. Well, let me tell you what someone else has done and what was or wasn't effective. There's some uh, research that has come out about sound recently. There is something in the research world called abstract cognition. Uh, neuroscientists know that abstract cognition is, is sort of their term for when a person is at their most creative. If you put a person in an fMRI machine and you watch how their brain lights up during creative endeavors, when they're creating music, when they're writing a book, when they're doing whatever it is they're doing that's, that's creative, the brain lights up in a very specific way. First of all, it all lights up in these tiny, tiny little pinpricks of light all around the brain. It's essentially the notion that your brain is alive and awake, but it's not focused on any one thing at the time. It's just sort of ready to go. It's primed, okay? That's abstract cognition. Uh, if, for those of you that, that feel overly creative in the shower, it is because of this, okay? This is why. Let me tell you what, what's happening. You are at a decibel rate where the sound is actually encouraging this sort of thinking about everything and thinking about nothing at the same time experience in your brain. So I can, I, I can explain this in a little more detail. So if you get a place where the decibel rating is over 85, it's too loud. Your brain is literally focused on whatever it is that's making the noise. It's sharp. It's, it's not pleasant. It's, it's too hard. 85 decibels is too much. However, if you get below 50 decibels, it's too little. By the way, the reason I've got a, a decibel range up here of 38, that's the average classroom. The average classroom has a decibel rate of, uh, rating of 38 which would suggest that one person is talking and only one person. If you want to see what it's like to have abstract cognition taking place because of sound enhancing that or helping that, let me show you how, how you do that by having you answer this question. At your table, please describe to the people you're with what was your very first memory of school. Go ahead. Stop! <laughs> Sorry, I scared you. That noise that happened just before I said stop, that level you had risen to, that's abstract cognition level. All right, You had gotten up to a roughly 76 decibels, so between 70 and 76 decibels. That's perfect. If you want to look for the most creative spaces in terms of education on your campus, all you have to do is listen. And what you're going to find is something that sounds like a coffee shop or a restaurant. That's how you find the most creative classrooms at, at any given time, is you just listen. Now, what Gordon said to me was, you want to enhance this? Get an iPad and uh, turn it on the sound machine so that you've got abstract cognition taking place in the room. The students don't even have to do it themselves. You can really start to change some of the equation of that learning space when you have the research, which is what I would want to put in your way after having you do something. Now, essentially, what I have just done 
is I have just given you a suggestion based on what Dan Meyer, who is a math and science teacher, and now a, uh, he's a, a Stanford fellow, has suggested that we begin doing when it comes to all education. Let me let him explain it to you using the, the format of Khan Academy and Angry Birds, okay? <laughs> Khan Academy and Angry Birds. He's gonna explain how this works, but he's going to explain the ultimate flipped learning model in 90 seconds. So see, see what you think of what Dan has to say. So maybe you've heard about this Angry Birds game and you wanna know what it's all about. The first thing you wanna do is download the app and then open the app. On the next screen, you're going to see a large button that says play on it. Go ahead and tap that button. Then on one side of the screen, you'll see a pig looking happy. On the other side of the screen, you'll see a slingshot with a bird who's angry inside of it. Pull that slingshot back on a trajectory that will hit that pig and explode it. That is the goal of Angry Birds. Now, after that, what we should notice is that- Okay, wait. Obviously Khan Academy would never lecture about Angry Birds, but what makes Angry Birds different from math and science? Angry Birds makes it easy to start playing, experiment, get feedback, and learn. I'm not saying lectures and explanations are never necessary in math and science or in Angry Birds for that matter. When I couldn't get past that one really tricky level, I went online and found a walkthrough. But the walkthrough, the explanation, wasn't the first thing I did when I experienced Angry Birds. So why does Khan Academy make an explanation the very first thing a student experiences with a new topic in math? When we put the explanation first, we get lousy learning and bored students. What I'm talking about here is the notion of doing first. Now think about it for a moment. How often do you do that in your classrooms? Most people, the model I grew up with, the model most of us grew up with was tell first. Let me tell you what's important and then maybe you go practice it. See the difference? When you go do first, you suddenly have to come back to me to get more information. I become a consultant. I become a facilitator. The, you have to go to the research, you have to go to the library, you have to go to the work, you have to go to the textbook, you have to go to the content. You have to go to other places now to find out how to make that do actually happen. The old mantra that we used to have for a long time was this, tell, show, do, review, ask. You may have heard this in your lifetime. In fact, you may have heard it just like that. I am going to encourage you to think about it a little bit differently. Tell, show, do, review, ask. They're the right five things to put in any educational context, but instead, we want to change the tell to do first. Let me see if I can help you encode this in your brains. I'd like you to please stand up and face one other person, just a comfortable distance apart. Okay, now here's what I'd like you to do. I'd like you to start marching in place. Now, one of you is going to say the word do. The other person will then say the word show. The next person will say the word tell and so on. Keep repeating the cycle. Get faster and faster and faster as you go. Go. Stop, good job. You can have a seat. Stop. By the way, we know from cognitive science and neuro neuroscience research, one of the best ways to reinforce what you've learned is to move. When you put movement in, in conjunction with learning, good things happen. Unfortunately, we tell students to stop moving with learning in about third grade. It's not adults. It's not, a, it's not right, so we tell them to sit down, shut up, and listen. Yeah. <laughs> uh, that is not the best way. All right, let me tell you how to find some of these assets like I have shown you today very quickly, and then, then we'll wrap up, all right? As we go through this, I want to basically talk about aggregators, I want to talk about social bookmarking, and I want to talk about search. In terms of aggregators, think about some of the great technologies we now have, like if this, then that. IFTTT.com is where you can go to get this. 
You create recipes based on what the internet has to send you stuff, to push stuff to you, to gather stuff for you. It says something like, if you receive a text message, please send it to your uh, Ever Evernote account. Or, if it's going to rain tomorrow, send me a text message. There's any number of ifs and thens, and you just have to go in and build a recipe. In fact, you can choose from thousands of recipes that have been already built. But it takes these kinds of principles I'm about to share with you and makes them easily consumable. So the first thing I want to recommend to you is something like All My Faves. AllMyFaves.com. This is my homepage, by the way, on my computer. When I go to AllMyFaves.com, it shares with me the 850 top sites on the internet in that particular month. Notice that most of them are things I use on a regular basis. I've got my bank here, I've got my email here. However, pertinent to this conversation is the very top line, the weekly faves. The weekly faves show me sites I have never seen before, ever, 10 of them. I make it my goal, and I do this every week, I spend less than 30 minutes, and I'm not just saying that for your sake, I spend less than 30 minutes a week going through 10 brand new sites I've never seen before to see if they would work in my classroom. Of the 10, I'll tell you this, eight of them almost always don't work. And I, I know that almost immediately. It's a game, it's a recipe engine, it's, you know, it's a site that helps you uh, find a tuxedo, whatever. There's just things that don't apply to what I teach. But inevitably, I'll find something that I'll think, huh, I wonder if I can use that. And I'll find another one and go, that's great. I can absolutely use that in my class. By the time I am done with a year, I've seen 520 brand new websites I would have never seen before that were pushed to me. I didn't have to go find them. They were given to me. At the same time, we can begin using sites like Zite to collect information. So if you're not familiar with Zite, Zite was actually just purchased by Flipboard, but it's, it's essentially the same thing. Where you go and say, here are things that I like. Please send me stuff like this. And it will do that. It will send you articles, it will send you blog posts, it will send you information based around a topic. And then you can take those things and you can push them out to something uh, like, like Pocket. So Pocket is a, uh, is a site that allows you to take your Zite or Flipboard information, put it into Pocket so you can read it on your iPad offline. Have your students create a Zite account at the beginning of the semester and then give them a couple of things to follow. And it will send them blogs, information from the Wall Street Journal. It will send them stuff from the New York Times. It will send them stuff from the Chronicle. It will send them information that is relevant to them. By the way, they can add to that. That site doesn't just have to be about educational stuff. They can mix in with it things that they also like, sports or entertainment or whatever else they want to. You can do the same. So as we start looking at these aggregators, my, my last one I want to tell you about is GoToWeb2O.net. GoToWeb2O.net allows you to go in and search for Web 2.0 interactive assets. In fact, they're searchable and they're filterable. So I can go up here, click on collaboration, and just see the collaboration sites. They have been ranked, rated, and reviewed by other people. Oftentimes, you're going to find they were ranked, rated, and reviewed by professors. And you can hear them say, this is how I use it in my class. So you can go out and find these sites that way. That's one way to fish. The second way that I want to talk to you about is social bookmarking. Every person in this room should be involved in a social bookmarking group, especially if you think about doing it within your program, your discipline. So we have one of these at Chaminade where I teach, and the other communication professors and I work in, in one of these environments, and this is what it looks like. When I find a site on, on the computer that I like, that I think, wow, this really works for education, this works for me, what do we typically do? We go into favorites and click add, right? That's an okay solution if you've only got 10 things. As soon as you get to 100 things, that's a horrible solution. And it's an even worse solution when you don't have your computer, right? Because those, those favorites are only on that machine. Social bookmarking eliminates that. Social bookmarking gives you, uh, whether it's StumbleUpon or Digo or Delicious, there's a number of social bookmarks out there. By the way, if you, have, if you don't have one, if you're just looking for one brand new, go to Delicious. It was the first one, first big one. It changed what meta tagging was on the internet. Delicious, it's easy. But basically what they'll do is they will ask you to install a little button on your browser that has their name on it. And so as you go through and you find a cool website and you think this would work for my class, you hit the button. It will come up with a little box and there'll be some information that's populated there that they populated. You can add your own if you'd like or not, it's your choice, and then hit close. That bookmark is now saved for you, with you, in your account, anywhere you go, on any computer, doesn't matter, all right? But the other cool part is that you can then share that bookmark with other people. 
you can share it with your colleagues. So you can actually say, here are some bookmarks I have found, and they're tagged, they've got metadata around them. And then the, the person can say, I just want to find stuff on interpersonal communication. Boom, there's all the interpersonal stuff from my account and from my peers, my colleagues. That's exactly how a social bookmarking area should work. So we don't have to reinvent the wheel every time, and we don't have to scour the internet every time. So when you put in inventory for interpersonal communication, instead of the 1.7 million hits you're going to get, go to Delicious and look at what your interpersonal communication teacher uses. And suddenly you go, oh, that was easy. The final thing you might consider is using just a basic search. Now, you've got to know the terms, right? You've got to be a good Googler. You know, that's in the, it's in the lexicon now. So as you think about that, put in your discipline and the word project. Put in your discipline and uh, group or collaboration. Put in your discipline and RLO, that stands for Reusable Learning Object. Put in your discipline and OER, that stands for Open Educational Resource. Those are the terms that people use in this industry. If you don't know them, it might feel like you've been left out of the club. But once you do know them, it's super easy to continue using them and to find more and more of these kinds of resources. Now please keep in mind, as you do this, you will find amazing assets out there. You just want to make sure that you cite them. This is from the University of California, Davis. This is a, uh, an eye exam that allows you to take away muscle settings in one eye or take away cranial nerve settings in one eye. That's what it would look like during an eye exam. Now think about the power of that for a moment. It would take a student sitting how long in a clinic before they get to see all that? Two months? Two years? Here, they see it in 20 minutes. When they're done, they can take a quiz, they can look at the eye theory, we can come back and have a conversation about it. It all turns into a teachable moment. And the students can review this over and over and over and over, as much as they want. These are the kinds of very, very powerful things we can find. This is my, one of my other favorites. This is for project management. Collaboration, group activities, team activities in education are only given about 17% of the time when students are going to be in teams roughly 78% of the time in the workforce. We've got to figure out how to do a better job of setting them up for success. This is the kind of site that can help. It's called Trello. Trello is a project management site. By the way, most students don't even know what project management is until they get into a business. Project management allows you to say who's responsible for what and when are they going to submit it. <coughs> then they can, of course, talk and have conversations and upload things. But here's the great part about this. When my students do a team project, at the end of the semester, they hand me their Trello report. Here's when everything was due, here's who was assigned to it, and here's when it was done. And if they didn't get it done, it's in black and white. No more he said, she said, no more, oh, this student was a bully, or this student didn't participate at all, or this leader took over and didn't let us participate. None of that. It doesn't happen. I get to see one report. It's all clear. It's right there. It also helps the students keep accountable during the project, rather than those students who tend to wander off and say, you know, last minute, oh, what do I need to do? They get to see it. These are the sorts of things that can help us make connections. That's my favorite of the C's of education, is connection. So let me close by saying this. I don't know if you remember, there was a video that came out years ago called Have You Been Paying Attention? Um, it was basically, oops, let me go back here. It was basically talking about how much change has happened because of the internet. And it's, it's, it, it doesn't even run anymore because even more change happens year after year after year that it's, it's almost it's outdated. But when it first came out, this, uh, as I was looking at it, they really sort of showed the mantra of Web 2.0. Students or teens were born into a digital world where they need to cr create, consume, remix, and share. I thought that was interesting. At the time that I was looking at this, I also used to read someone called EduBlogger. The very first EduBlogger was anonymous. Nobody knew who it was. Man or woman, higher ed, case up, nobody knew. But EduBlogger used to just sort of sit back and sort of take pot shots at the, at the uh, institution and say some things were great, some things were horrible, and it was really interesting. I, I, so I, I just followed EduBlogger. I want to see what EduBlogger had to say. When EduBlogger saw this particular video, this was what EduBlogger's response was. Educators must teach students to be original, have original thought, and do original work. We'd still be hoping someone would invent the rolling stone <laughs> to create the wheel. Imagine a world where using other people's work to create your own was OK. EduBlogger did not like this video, talking about create, consume, remix, and share. We'd never have gotten past the toaster to see the benefits of the microwave. We'd never have gotten past swing music to see, uh, 
to, to experience amazing original works like Elton John's The Lion King or other seminal, seminal works. That may say something about your blogger. I don't know. <laughs> but I thought about that. Is this world of technology just encur encouraging plagiarism? Are we really just making it easier for students to steal other people's stuff? Is that not how, is that not what they're supposed to be doing? And so I thought about it. I really did. But as I thought about it, you know when you get a song stuck in your head? I had Elton John's The Lion King stuck in my head. <laughs> I can't believe they said it. I, it really it bothered me that, that they even said it. So I, I put down the track to it. I had this in my head. And here's, here's what I could hear over and over and over again. It goes, can you feel the love tonight? You know that song? Yeah? So I'm thinking about that over and over again. As I'm thinking about Edge of Blogger and Edge of Blogger State. And, and, and as I'm kind of playing that on guitar and just thinking and thinking and thinking, all of a sudden something else pops in my head. And as I'm listening to this, here, here's what I then heard, and this was disturbing to me. Say tonight. But the break of dawn come tomorrow, tomorrow I'll be gone. And then I heard this, you're beautiful. Oh no, you're beautiful. And Jim was right. These people are stealing the chords. They just stole these chords, put their own words on top of it, and called it a song. And, and so then I heard this, if I could and I would. I'll go wherever you will go. It's exactly the same thing. That you blogger was right. Elton John wrote the most powerful song of all time, apparently. And people have just been ripping it off time and time again. In fact, in fact, do you remember this one? Remember this? Adele won a Grammy with this. Goes, never mind, I found someone like you. You know that song? I wish nothing but <laughs> yeah, no. So anyway, I'm listening, and I'm listening, and listening, and listening, and I'm thinking, this is crazy. Etchublogger is on to something. And then I heard something weird in my head, something that wasn't supposed to be there. I heard something that happened before 1986. I heard this. Harry Truman Doris Day, Red Chum, <laughs> Billy Joel! Of course! Elton John stole it from Billy Joel. That makes much more, more sense, right? I can accept that. But as I'm going through, I start hearing other things. Again, that happened even before this. Earlier that year, out came this. Richard Marks. Wherever you go, whatever you do, I will be right. He sang that at my prom. <laughs> I'm not making that up. He really did. I could not accept that Richard Marx wrote a song that was that amazing that everybody stole it. I kept thinking, I kept thinking, I kept thinking. And then, sure enough, immediately, in fact, I, I heard this. I think we're alone. <laughs> Doesn't seem to be. No way. I was not going to let Tiffany open that song. There's no way. No way. All right. So I kept thinking. I kept playing. I kept, I kept thinking. What else? What else? And then, and then I got this. We're not going to take it. Right? <laughs> no, we ain't going to take it. Twisted Sister. <laughs> Dee Snyder. That's right. Dee Snyder. Dee Snyder did not write this. <laughs> he did not. I, I, I kept going. I kept going now. I started to play around with it now, because now I'm starting to get excited, right? So I started playing around with this a little bit. I got out some other equipment, and I took out the guitar, and I just put in a bass. Tell me what you hear here. You hear the bass? Yeah. When I hear that, I hear this. See the stone set in her eyes. Yeah? You too. Is that all right? Does that work? Could Bono have written the most powerful song of all time? Yes. yes. Sure. I mean, he's, he's single-handedly saving Africa. Certainly, he could have done this, right? Yeah. It wasn't Bono. You can go back to a little before that, in the early 80s, and you'll come across a band from Sweden who sang this. Take on me. Do you know it? Take on me. Take I'll be gone. How about oh hey? I have no idea. No idea what that guy says. 
Aha, from Sweden, yeah, aha. Uh -huh. Which, by the way, they named it that because it means the same thing in Sweden as it means in the United States. It's pretty cool. But they did not write this song. All right, they didn't. You can go back before 1984, and you will find something like this about a little journey. Does this work? Well, just a small town girl living in a lonely world. That's right, it's good to you That's right. No, it wasn't Steve Perry, it was not Journey. How about this? I can go back to the 70s. How does this work for you? Remember this in 1976? Remember this? On your mark, get set, and go now. Got a dream. Laverne and Shirley. You guys are all just like, Laverne and Shirley. You don't remember Laverne and Shirley? It's all right. It wasn't Laverne and Shirley. It was not Laverne and Shirley. You can go back a little before that. This one you guys might buy. You, you might accept this. I find myself time to trouble other day. Oh, now you're singing. All right, this is okay. This is your this is your music. Okay, good, good. I got it. Could the Beatles have written this? The most powerful song replicated over and over again. They could have. They didn't. You can go back to the '60s and you'll find this. When the night has come. You know this one? Yeah. And the land is dark. It was not B.B. King. He did not write this for Stand By Me. You can go back to the 50s, you can go back to the 40s, you can go back to the 30s, you can go back to Waltzing Matilda. You can go back to the entire 1800s and you will not find the originator of this chord progression until you get back to 1790. Taco Bell's Cannon in the media. That's where this comes from. <laughs> Create, consume, remix, and share is how life works. I think Edu Blogger had it wrong. Yeah. I'm going to finish with this last quote. John Medina said this in his book. He's a neuroscientist who wrote Brain Rules. As I was writing Brain Rules, it hit me. If you wanted to design a learning environment that was directly opposed to what the brain is naturally good at doing, you would design something like a classroom. <laughs> We know more about the brain and more about learning than we've ever known before, ever. We know more about how people learn effectively. We know that it takes another C word here, confluence. It takes times of mass dissemination of information, but it also takes times of technology. It takes times of team effort and group effort and collaboration. It also takes time of do, tell, show, review, act. It takes time of augmented reality. It takes data. It takes so much more to educate at scale using what we know. It is our job as educators to keep up with it. What I'm trying to suggest to you today is that as you marry these things all together, it's not about one or the other. It's about both in the right context at the right time for the right student. I want to thank you very much for your time. We have a couple of minutes left for some questions. I'm happy to take a few questions if you've got them. We just got songs in our head. Yeah, yeah, sorry, sorry. <laughs> okay, uh, do you still tell, yeah, because I was pretty sad, except for the do. Do you think the do incorporates I do, we do, and then you do? <laughs> yeah, like there's a lot of do-do. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> so, yes, the do is modeling. Here is how I, I would do it, although that's not always the first step. Modeling is not always the best way because then you get templatized education, and that's not what we're after. If we're looking for creativity and critical thinking, it's not just about here's how I would do it. That, that should be a component, but it's really asking the question, how would you do it? And then they start, they go off, because now they have to figure that out. Now, sometimes that might be replicating some things or imitating some things. It might be other times, it might be coming up with some way they do it completely on their own. Let me give you an example of that. If I say to my class, now you, you imagine this in your own classroom for just a minute. If I say to my students, I have a, a, an assignment. I want, to, I want you to answer these three questions. You're going to answer them for the entire class in three weeks. I'm going to put you in groups of seven. Go. What would they do? I'll tell you what my students would do. Whoa, 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 professor. What do you mean answer the questions? I mean answer the questions. You, you want a paper. You want a paper. We'll write a paper. Right? Is that do you want? To, do you have a paper from last semester we could see that we can imitate? No, no, no. I don't care if you write a paper. Answer the questions. Right, right, right. You're a speech guy. You want us to do a speech. 
Yeah, it's going to be about how many citations do you think we should put in that speech? I don't care. Answer the question. If we set the outcome at the beginning, the students can get to that outcome in any number of ways, and we've got to be open to that. Doing first allows that to happen. So yes, sometimes it's here how I would do it, but sometimes that conversation takes place after they come to you and say, we're trying to figure out how to do it, how should we? And then you can have that conversation. Any other question? Yeah. Is, is your presentation available on? Um, I'll, on I'll give my presentation to Adrian, and she can uh, okay, get, get it out to the Thank world. You. Right. And feel free to share with anybody you want. Thank you very much. Yeah, yeah. All right, wait. <laughs> um, wow. So I love everything you're saying, but in the time constraints we have, um, like doing takes a really long time and for them to research and really understand how do we balance the you know traditional 15 week semester hour and 20 minute twice a week class sure. with the time sure uh, the the best way for me to exemplify that is actually by using Dan Meyer again uh, Google Dan Meyer M E Y E R and you will find his website I think it's mrmeyer.com actually and he will show you asset after asset after asset that he has used to create do moments in a short period of time. He has even he had shorter with his high school students. They only had 40 minute periods, and then more when he got got a little older. So there's a couple ways to do it. First of all, think longitudinally. There are projects that that really do incorporate a lot of things over the course of 15 weeks, uh, and you've got to allow that to happen. Allow your students to get there on their own sometimes, but they'll get there. But at the same time, the the best illustration of this that I can give, Dan Meyer uh, made his, his his name because he asked a question that made they got him on the Today Show. He put in front of his students two pictures. Uh, it was a grocery uh, clerk checkout lane. There was one cart that had 19 items in it, and there was one. There was a, a row that had five different carts with less than 19 items. And he said to his students, "Which one is the fastest line? Which one's going to get you out of the store fastest?" Now, listen. Yes, yeah, some people are answering the question. There, there's not a good answer, and this is what got him in a little bit of trouble at first. Parents started calling him and saying, "You've asked my student an unanswerable question." Right? You've asked them to do something that they can't do. And he said, why can't they do it? And he, they said, well, what if the checkers knew? What if they're using coupons? What if there's a credit card? What if it's writing a check? There's all these variables. <laughs> and Dan Meyer would say, so you're talking about the math variables in the equation. And they'd go, oh, sorry, Mr. Meyer, keep doing what you're doing. <laughs> yeah, that's right. But they were doing first. And they could do that in one class period. After he was done, he would just say, he would take bets. Take, he'd say, which one's faster? And they would vote and argue. And then somebody would say, well, Mr. Meyer, what if someone's using a coupon? Oh, well, let's talk about that as a variable. And let's write that down. Let's figure out what we need to figure out in order to make this equation happen. The do came first. He's got hundreds of assets like that on the site. Jim, any other questions? Hi, this is just a very simple question. It's about gamification, which I find really interesting. But um, you know that moment back when we did the songs and it wasn't until you hit the Simon Garfunkel, like everyone kicked in? Yep. Yeah, that's my problem with gamification. My kids play games, I watch them totally engaged, I can see the students in the libraries doing it. I learned how to make education a game. For me, doing research papers is a game. You know, listening to lectures, I, I kind of gamify it internally. So. I have a hard time relating to kind of modern gamification, and every now and then I'll start in, oh, Minecraft is great, or Portal is great, to get this experience to understand what it is that the students are experiencing. And I have such a hard time getting there because I'm not motivated and it's not relevant to me. It's like a Lightfoot exercise. Why would I waste my time in Portal or Minecraft building stuff when I can actually be doing research or creative writing? Or so I was just wondering, do you have suggestions uh, maybe for some of the games out there that you know students in our age group are doing that might also engage us or give us a picture into that particular thing rather than what I've learned to gamify? Yes, uh, two things. First of all, motivation is the key word there. To me, games are all about motivation because they're both intrinsic and extrinsic. If you read Carol Dweck, which I hope you have all read Mindset, it is a book every educator should read. 
but uh, mindset talks about the importance of both kinds of, of motivation. Specifically, you get better results with intrinsic motivation, period, always, without bar none. All right, when you, get, when you find a way to get students to be motivated by their own thoughts, devices, desires, better things are going to happen. So when you look at gaming, uh, a couple of things. Number one, don't be afraid to ask students to make their own games. One of the greatest models we have out there is an alternate reality game that, that Jane, Jane McGonagall created called The World Without Oil. What would we do in a world without oil? What would happen? Let your students determine the world without X. What is X to them? What matters both in terms of your content as well as what matters to them socially or in terms of culture or whatever it might be. They can actually build games for you that you can find teachable moment after teachable moment. In. That's, that's number one. Number two, when you go to serious games or if you Google gamification for learning, you are going to come across four or five big repositories. The seriousgames.com repository has the kinds of games you're asking for that are video games. Now notice, I, I'm not just saying games are video games. There are hundreds of different modalities of game. People always think about Sega up to Xbox. You know, that's kind of the, the progression we make in our head. When we talk about games and education, everyone goes, oh, a video game. That's not the only game, but there, there are some good ones out there. Immune Attack is excellent for nurses. Um, Discover Babylon, excellent for sociology, for, his, for history, uh, for government. Uh, there's some really, and those were created by the Federation of American Scientists in conjunction with Sony PlayStation. So when you go to some of these repositories, you'll want to plug in your discipline, and you'll find some of the things that are appropriate and relevant for you. Okay. Excellent. Thank you so much. Thank you, everybody. I want to wrap this up. And another big thank you to Dr. Jeff Williams. I was inviting you. Thank you so much.